Welcome to Highlands Presbyterian Church. We hope you enjoy listening to the message for today. We are going back to basics as our theme for the year. Each week we will add another brick as we build on the layers. Good morning, saints. So great to be with you this morning. I'm so thrilled that I didn't have to go in the cold water this morning. Uh, But well done. Where's Daniel? Well done. Amazing. Awesome. I'm going to just start my timer again for your sake. This protects you from me. And uh, you do have the luxury of knowing that I, I have to keep it short. I've, got, I've gone back to old school, so I've got some printed pages here. And I know five pages means 20 minutes, basically. Uh, we have a hard stop because I have a plane ca- to catch, so you are, you're safe. We are going back to basics. We are rebuilding the wall. And there can be a, a bit of defiance around that. We will rebuild. But actually, we know that the reality is that he will restore and perhaps reform us according to his perfect will and purposes. There can be no defiance. There can be no, we will, we will, in our own strength, we're going to do this or do that. No. We submit and humbly commit ourselves to the ways of the Lord. And so I want to just do a bit of a mid-season recap, review. And now with us, I know Amy spoke to us a little bit about this last week and kind of spoke about the journey that we're on. And and where are we at in the journey? And do we have this wailing child kind of the whole way with us on the journey? Are we the wailing child? kind of, you know, um, and then I just love this morning, I love, we don't plan these things, we don't sort of discuss, so I I haven't spoken to Sheila, I didn't know what she was going to say today, but the verse that she started with about running the race, uh, it's all kind of aligning, and it aligns perfectly with what I had planned, or what the Lord put on my heart for today. So I want to just open with prayer, I've got at the top of my notes here, K-I-S-S, which is kind of, you know, it's an acronym for Keep It Simple Saint, which is kind of my, it's, it's what God, you know, sort of gives me. He keeps saying that to me. Uh, keep it simple. And so I'm going to hopefully try and go bullet points through and be quite simple and quite straightforward and leave you some takeaways. But I couldn't help, as I looked at that K-I-S-S, I couldn't help just remembering a quick story about a wedding that I did a few weeks ago. And, you know, we, after the wedding now, we've got, they want a, a shot of the guests. And so, you know, the pastor's there and, you know, the, the couple in front of us. And everyone's kind of gathered all the mates in and a you know, big wide shot with 100 people. And, and so there's a few pictures and we're all sort of smiling. And so I just put my arm around this, you know, very handsome, sweet old gentleman that was standing next to me and stood next to him with this. And I, you know, and then the, the photographer shouts, now, now, kiss, give, give, kiss. So I, I said, uh, tongue or no tongue? <laughs> So, Father, thank you. Thank you that you are a God of joy and peace and purpose and life. Thank you, Jesus, that you came, that we might have life and live it to the full. We submit ourselves to you this morning. We commit our allegiance to you, God, afresh, anew. We take our place today in your story, and we give you the praise and the honor and the glory and the thanks. Seal this time now. In the finished work of your cross, we pray, and lead us in all things for your name and for your renown. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So where are we? Where are we at on the race, on the journey, in the story? Where where do we find ourselves today on the 14th of July in 2024? There's just been an an assassination attempt on former President Trump. I don't know if any of you have picked that up yet in the early hours of this morning for us here in Zimbabwe. A uh, lone shooter, gunman on a roof somewhere, um, hit him in the ear. There's a photo I saw of blood streaming down the side of his face. The guys running around, you know, the Secret Service rushed him off the stage. A spectator behind him was killed, two more injured. What's going on? Where do we find ourselves in the grand narrative? We find ourselves in a world at war. We find ourselves in evil days. Whichever side we're on, wherever we're at, we know that evil has raised its head and the days are evil. So so where is God in this? What's happening? Who is he? Let's just reframe and kind of understand and and, and have a kind of a foundation as we try to interpret and try to understand all of the world events that I will then kind of just just quickly go through. Um, So God is a God of order. There are principles and precepts. There is structure, there are laws, there is authority, and there's hierarchy. There are powers and principalities. That is his world, and he's formed and fashioned and shaped and molded the physical world 
into that spiritual world. And so everything that we see and understand around us aligns with those principles, and he too is accountable to those principles. So God is a God of if, then. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then. He, he constrains himself by these same laws, and he says, I'm not going to act until, if you will act, then I will come through for you. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. He is also God of suddenly, kairos moments, suddenly, in the appointed moment, at the appointed time, suddenly, Lot's wife glanced back over her shoulder as she's fleeing the shock and awe campaign that, that God had released on Sodom and Gomorrah. She glanced over her, so, her shoulder and suddenly she turns to a pillar of salt because she disobeyed orders. God moves in the instant and in the millennia. So Israel remained in exile for 2,000 years before being regathered, the exiles returning home after 2,000 years, when Israel was regathered as a nation state in 1948, Israel is a signal state. They are a chosen people that God uses to display his power, to teach about his kingdom principles. He uses Israel as a model to explain and for how, to help us kind of see and understand and internalize his love, mercy, power, and the nature of kingdom authority. Jesus said in Matthew 4, uh, Matthew 24, 32 to 35, take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds, from the merest hint of green, you know summer is just around the corner. So it is with you. When you see these things taking place, you must know that he is at the door. Do not take this lightly. What's he talking about? He's talking about the return of the Messiah. He's talking about the end of this age. You must learn from the fig tree. We discern the times, read the seasons, understand, have, have, have wisdom and discernment to understand what is taking place or what is about to take place, what's coming. When the fig leaf turns green at the merest hint of green, you know that summer is, is on its way. When you see these things, and I will detail these things a little bit later, using the principles, I just want to draw a line before I go into that, using the principles that we've learned and watching the signal state of Israel, we know a few things. Number one, we are in the end times, fact. Number two, Christ followers will be persecuted. We're told that from Jesus. The love of many will grow cold. If we live a certain way, then we will be saved. Number five, it is going to happen suddenly. It is going to be catastrophic for the enemies of Christ. It is going to be, oh, happy day for those that love Jesus and know him and have committed their, their lives to serving him and honoring him and fulfilling their calling. So what are the signs of the end of the age? What was Jesus talking about in Matthew 24 when he said, discern, listen, watch, be ready, be looking for these things. And when you see these things like the fig tree, you know something is happening. Something is about to happen. It may take the next 50 years. It may take the next 500 years. But whenever it happens, it's going to happen suddenly. And so we need to be ready, friends. Matthew 24 says, You are going to hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over for persecution, and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will take offense. Many will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. 
this good news of the kingdom of, of God will be proclaimed to all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The gospel has not yet reached all the tribes, all the peoples of the entire nation, of, of the entire continent, uh, planet. We know that. So the end can't come yet. But with multimedia and streaming and uh, satellite, internet all over the world, that can happen very quickly. So we, we, are, we are close. For the first time in, in history, we are this far away from the gospel having been preached or available to everyone on the planet, accessible through... <laughs> And that's what I love about, about this adventure. It is an adventure. Adventure by definition is something that is risky. It's something that is unknown. We don't know what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. That's why it's called faith. We've got to believe. We've got to walk moment by moment. And so what I want to take us through is, is this strategy. And I believe that if we have these three Ps that Jesus himself gives us this strategy, Jesus himself in his final kind of teaching to eyes. Right, this is, this is in Matthew 25. It's the end of his ministry. He's about to be handed over. He's a, the, next, the very next thing that happens is that the guys come and arrest him and, and kind of it's, it's, it's over. And so the last three parables that he teaches are in Matthew 25. If this is the final teaching, the final lesson where he knows what's happening, it's kind of... It's, it's the most important thing. The people, uh, you know, people's dying words are recorded and saved and, and immortalized because they are the most important things that some people say in their entire lives. Queen Elizabeth I said, all my possessions for a moment of time. There's, there's others. Um, there's, a, there's a great one where um, uh, I think Danny was telling me about this, so uh, she's learning about this at school. And this, this guy said, um, so... His final words were, um, can you hold the ladder, please? And, and that was, uh, no, 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 sorry, I got that wrong. He said, are you still holding the ladder, were his final words. But uh, your final words are important because they tell us about what's most important to you. They tell us about who you, who you are and what you would like us to remember about you. So Jesus' final words are really critical he says in Matthew 25, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were sensible. When the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take olive, uh, didn't take olive oil with them. But the sensible ones took olive oil in their flasks with their lamps. Since the, the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout, "Here's the groom! Come out and meet him!" Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. The sensible ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead uh, to those who buy and sell, and buy oil for yourselves. When they had gone to buy oil, the groom arrived. Then there was uh, those that were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the rest came and said, Master, Master, open up for us as well. But he replied, I assure you, I do not know you. Therefore... Be alert because you do not know the time or the day. So lesson number one, be prepared. That's, that's the takeaway from, from that parable. Be prepared, be ready. Okay. Parable number two, parable of the talents. Just in the interest of time, I will just skip over it. I think we, we're all quite familiar with it. Uh, the master is going away on a journey. He leaves his possessions, his talents, his coins with um, his servants. He gives five to one, two to another, and one to another, uh, and says, you know, be, multi be faithful. Uh, the one with five doubles them and comes back. When the master comes back from his journey, the one with the five has ten. And he says, master, you gave me five, and I've, I've earned five more. Here, take what is yours. And the, the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. The second one, same thing. Here, you gave me two. Here's two more. Here's four. The one with the one uh, went and buried it and hid it. Then the master comes back and he says, I knew that you were a harsh man, so I was afraid. And so I buried your talent, and, and here it is. I dug it up. Take what is yours. And the master is furious with this guy. He says, 
take that one from him and throw him out into the place where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. If we are unfaithful, even the little that we have will be taken from us. If we are faithful, God adds to faithfulness. God will multiply where he finds faithfulness. We are to be faithful. So lesson number two, be productive. Be faithful. Uh, productivity surplus uh, is, the, is the fruit of faithfulness. Let's be faithful with what God has given us. Be faithful with what God is telling us to do as we serve, as we are faithful in that place and doing that thing. Uh, when our master returns, let him find us doing what we were gifted and created and called to do for his glory. If we are found faithful, we will be, we will be saved. So lesson number two is be productive. Parable number three, the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. That's a blueprint for what we're supposed to be doing with our lives. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for people. No one is designed to go there. It was designed for the devil and his angels. But we will go there if we do not heed this warning. Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not take care of me. Then they too will answer, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Lesson number three, prioritize the poor. Jesus' mission statement in Isaiah 61 was preach the good news to the poor. His final teaching in those parables, right before he's handed over to, to Pontius Pilate, is this responsibility to record and carry this message, his heart, throughout the ends of the world. And he says to them, consider the poor. Make a plan for the poor. In Galatians 2, after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection and ascendance, the, the disciples are planning. Now they've, they've, you know, discipling the Jews and they're going out now to the ends of the earth. And Paul and Barnabas are being commissioned and sent out to the ends of the earth, to the, to the Galatians, um, to the... Uh, the Gentiles, and they leave them with this one command. Consider the poor. Don't forget the poor. Make a plan for the poor. Remember the poor. So recap in our last minute. Number one, if you live in a certain way and watch what is happening to Israel, then you can prepare Train, condition, expect, and be ready for the deception, the offense, and the heartache that is coming. For many of us, that has already come. So be prepared. Be productive. Prioritize the poor. When the master returns or calls you home, 
What will his assessment of your attitude toward the poor be? If you don't remember anything else from anything that I've said today or or what we've done this morning, friends, I beg of you, remember this. In every decision that you will make from this day forth, as you express and enjoy and lean into and exercise your gifts with passion and purpose and every ounce of motivated ability that was given to you, will you please consider others as more important than yourselves? Consider the poor. Try to make a plan for them because this is true humility and unselfishness. This is the golden ticket to eternity and a seat at the bridegroom's table when he returns as a conquering king. If you go all in on this one thing, then you are guaranteed to win the game of life. Just one thing, consider the poor. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for your model. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you for exposing us to the Father's heart, to the will of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to prioritize the poor to lay down our lives, to sacrifice, to serve, just as you did, as you showed us the way, as you modeled for us the way that we are to live and commit and serve and sacrifice our lives for the needs of those around us. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the privilege of living in a part of the world where we are surrounded by by poverty, not only material but spiritual. I pray, Lord God, that you would endow us with the gifts to be able to respond. Give us the words to say and how to say it. I I pray that you would tell us what to do and how to do it, that we would use the abundance of resources and time and talents and gifts that you have bestowed upon us, that we would use these things to be beacons of hope into a hopeless land, beacons of life into a broken world. I pray that we would be a voice for the voiceless, that we would defend the downtrodden, that we would speak up, that we would stand up, and that we would become today who you created us to be, dead to sin, and alive to God. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way in us today, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Your tithe or offering is greatly appreciated. Please see the bank details attached.